How's everybody doing? Welcome back to another episode of The Banker Next Door. I am your host, Dr. Joe Berquist, your friendly neighborhood weekend warrior financial person's back. Uh, <laughs> good to be back again this weekend. So, uh, okay, I've got a ton of news and a ton of updates for everybody this week. A lot of craziness happening around you know, New York Community Bank. Um, Jeremy Powell was up on Capitol Hill giving testimony for a couple of days. Um, a lot of banking news, a lot of different things going on. So let's get into some of the stuff. So what I'll do is I'll hit some of the news. Then we'll talk a little bit about Jeremy Powell's testimony. And then we'll go back. We'll look at you know what's on tap for this week, we'll talk about a little bit about some of the economic indicators and things that came out this last week, and then we'll hit some uh, we'll hit some more news here before we uh, we wrap up. So, okay, so what do we got here, news wise? Um, we got Minneapolis-based asset uh, manager Ameriprise Financial is bracing for a $50 million penalty to settle SEC charges of re uh, record-keeping failures related to unauthorized electronic communications by financial advisors and employees, Investment News reported. Um, Citigroup plans to expand its wealth management business in the greater Bay Area, greater Bay Area and the rest of Asia with uh, Hong Kong as its base. Base, uh, South China Morning Post is reporting. Uh, Minneapolis-based U.S. Bank has asked employees to work from office at least three days a week with their performance review depending on it, Axios Twin Cities report, um, citing a memo that was sent to employees in January. So interesting. Over a third of U.S. banks say they will miss the deadline for the adoption of ISO uh, 20022, an international financing messaging standard that is set to go into effect in March of 2025, um, as they are still working through the adoption of the Federal Reserve's uh, faster payments or services, FedNow, the American banker reported. Uh, Banco Santander cut around 320 jobs in the U.S. as it seeks to invest in digitization of its branches, Bloomberg Law reported. Um, BlackRock is focusing on transition investing, focusing on infrastructure projects that will help speed the transition from fossil fuels rather than pushing for changes in corporate behavior, talking about hard to quantify social issues or, or actively promoting uh, ESG investing criteria. So that's interesting. So I, I'll probably have a little bit more on that in a, in a, in a minute or two. But yeah, so BlackRock is is not going to talk about ESG anymore. They're just going to, you know, go full bore ahead with this uh, transition investing. Um, the Federal Home Loan Bank recorded a 111% jump in year over year profits to $6.7 billion on December 31st, 2023, and paid $3.4 billion in dividends to its members, up from $1.4 billion paid in 2022, American Banker reported. Uh, London based digital lender Monzo Bank raised $430 million in its latest fundraising that valued it at over $4.5 billion as it prepares to return to the US, the Financial Times reported. Hedge fund giant Citadel Advisors is making headway in its plan to move its headquarters from Chicago to Miami as the waterfront site it bought for the new headquarters remains empty and the outlines of the office plans are starting to take shape. Um, an appeals court in Montenegro rejected a lower court decision to extradite crypto tycoon uh, Du Quan to the U.S. to face trial on fraud charges. The Wall Street Journal reported, citing a March 4th ruling. The appeals court agreed that Quan's lawyers uh, that the lower court decision was flawed and sent the case back for a new trial. Um, short sellers targeting exchange traded funds tied to regional U.S. banks raked in $977 million on paper for Spider S&P Regional Bank ETF and $663 million in paper profits for Invesco KBW Regional Banking ETF, Reuters reported, citing analytics from Ortex, uh, market jitters stirred by New York Community Bank's fallout from exposure to the troubled commercial real estate sector helped benefit the short sellers, whose top targets across the two ETFs were Bank of Hawaii, Axios Financial, and Columbia Financial. Uh, Morgan Stanley launched a private markets transaction desk to serve eligible investors who are looking to buy and sell eligible private company shares in the secondary market for deeper portfolio diversification. Jed Finn, head of Morgan Stanley Wealth Management, said in a press release, 
Uh, growth stage venture-backed global companies with over $1 billion in value have increased from 150 in 2015 to over 1000 today with a cumulative valuation of $4.3 trillion. A group of seven banks led by Morgan Stanley is in talks with Elon Musk and his team about refinancing a debt package worth about $12.5 billion that was used for the tech billionaires uh, take private bid for social media platform X formerly known as Twitter. Bloomberg News reported, citing people with knowledge of the matter, the lender ha uh, have been struck with the uh, the lenders have been stuck with the debt since 2022 and have repeatedly renewed a deal uh, not to individually offload their holdings, according to the report. So uh, some Coinbase global users saw zero balances in their accounts on March 4th as a second outage hit the platform in less than a week after the first incident, Bloomberg News reported, citing a Coinbase spokesperson who reportedly said the problem was just a display issue. The glitch came as Bitcoin climbed toward a new record high of nearly 69,000, the report said. Uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau finalized its proposed rule to limit financial institutions' credit card late fees. Uh, the agency moved ahead with slashing the maximum fee institutions can collect for missed credit card payments to $8 from the current average of 32, despite intense industry pushback. The new rule, however, only applies to card issuers with at least 1 million open accounts, giving in to calls from community banks and credit unions to adjust the rule as it would disproportionately affect them. Uh, the U.S. SEC's final climate disclosure rule for public companies and public offerings received disapproval from Chairman of the House Financial Services Committee, Patrick McHenry, who said the agency is not a climate regulator, I would agree with that, and raised the rule's immense consequences on the capital markets and the U.S. economy. The agency on March 6th voted to eliminate Scope 3 emissions uh, reporting requirements and exempt several thousand smaller and emerging growth companies from reporting. Nearly 60% of SEC registered U.S. companies will not have to track or report their greenhouse gases to investors under the rule, agency officials said in a call with reporters before the vote. Um, even with a scaled back framework, industry experts foresee legal and legislative challenges for the regulator in the future, American Banker reported. Yes, undoubtedly. Um, Let's see what else we got. Uh, BlackRock Inc.'s Bitcoin exchange traded fund reported a record inflow of $788 million on March 6th in its 37th conse consecutive influx as Bitcoin price reached an all-time high. Um, FTX trading reached an $874 million settlement with bankrupt, bankrupt cryptocurrency lender BlockFi pending court approval, Reuters reported, citing court documents filed March 6th. Under the agreement, FTX will prioritize a $250 million payment to BlockFi with the remaining amount contingent upon its own plans to repay customers according to the report. Okay, the number of weak U.S. banks has increased by 18% a year after the failure of Silicon Valley Bank, the Financial Times reports, citing an FDIC report. The U.S. banking sector's profits fell by nearly half in the last quarter of 2023 as big banks paid fees to help recoup costs incurred by FDIC from several bank failures last year, the FDIC report said. Uh, I did a whole episode on that. I'll talk about that a little later. So um, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission deferred its decision on approving the trading of options on exchange traded funds that invest directly in Bitcoin, Bloomberg News reported. The SEC deferred on a filing from CBOE Exchange, Inc. to offer options tied ETF holding Bitcoin and on a filing from NASDAQ to list and trade options on BlackRock's iShares Bitcoin Trust, the report said. Um all right. And then uh, and then a couple things on we're going to get into Jeremy Powell's comments here now and just a couple things. So Federal Reserve Chairman Jeremy Powell believes that the U.S. banking system can withstand commercial real estate threats. Bloomberg News reported, citing the central bank's chief statement as a Senate banking committee hearing. Powell told the lawmakers that the Fed is talking with lenders to make sure they are on top of potential losses. Uh Jeremy Powell also said the central bank is not far from gaining the confidence it needs in falling inflation to start cutting interest rates. Um, okay. So let's see a couple of the reports that we have here on Mr. Jeremy Powell. So some key takeaways. Jeremy Powell delivered his semi-annual report on the economy to the Senate Banking Committee on Thursday. His comments hit on many of the same notes as the prior day when he spoke before a House committee, giving little insight into when the Federal Reserve would cut interest rates. 
Senators urged Powell to cut rates soon to ease cost pressures on consumers and also questioned the central banker about his comments on the economic impact of migration, among other issues. Um, let's see here. He did not, Jeremy Powell did not diverge from the messaging that members of the Federal Reserve's Open Markets Committee have delivered since the beginning of the year. While rate cuts are likely, the committee would like more confidence that inflation won't return before making more moves, he said. Uh, markets still rallied on the comments and expectations for a rate cut increase. So, um, so let's see here. Despite Powell's note of caution, equities rallied midday on Wednesday after a slump the day before. Investors priced in a nearly 90% chance of at least one rate hike by July, according to the CME Group's FedWatch tool, which forecasts based on the Fed Fund's futures trading data. Uh, the likelihood of cuts in May and June was still small, but increased after Powell's testimony. While maintaining that inflation has fallen dramatically, Powell continues to indicate that the fight against inflation is not done and that the risks of cutting too early are great. Um, okay, and then... Jeremy Powell testified also on the Basel III rules facing uh, and basically said that they could face material changes or reproposal. So, um, so the banking industry's Basel III proposal pushback looks poised to pay off. It is likely that when the federal bank regulators unveil the final Basel III endgame capital rule, it will, it will be materially different than what was initially proposed. Uh, Jeremy Powell said, I do expect that there will be a broad and material changes to the proposal. I'm confident that the final product will be one that does, does have broad support, both at the Fed and in the broader world. Further, he did not rule out the possibility of a re-proposal. It's, uh, it's a very plausible option, he said. If, when we get to that point, that turns out to be the appropriate thing, we won't hesitate to do it. Right now, the agency is nowhere near making a decision on the final rule as it reviews comment letters and results of the quantitative study it requested in October. We're just now reaching the stage where we can begin to make decisions. We really haven't made any decisions yet. So um, so we'll see. So they're definitely looking on that. I, I don't think there's any doubt uh, that that Basel III, the end game, the proposal there, the capital rules are going to be different. So um and then, you know, and then this is just another article basically saying that, the, you know, the market waits or waits on Fed cuts as doubts rise about the return to low rates. Um, I would just say this, you know, um, Apollo Management Group last week and then um, who was it? An analyst for Bank of America basically came out and said that they think that rate any reduction in rates this year is basically off the table, that there's just not there's nothing else to go in. There, there's just not enough ammunition there for the Fed to reduce the rates. Uh, and I, I think there's a lot of plausibility to that. I mean, when you look at the inflation numbers for the last month or so, I mean, PC, so you got um, uh, the producer price index, consumer price index, and you have the PCE. So the, the PPI, the CPI, and the PCE, all three of them saw upswings, you know, some, you know, PCE, maybe not quite as much as the CPI, but, you know, the, the, those three main inflation gauges are, are creeping back up. You know, they stopped going down and they're creeping back up just as I just as I uh, proposed that they would. And I think that that is going to basically prohibit the Fed from decreasing rates. I mean, there's there's too much money uh, being spent by the, the government right now. It's just feeding that inflation bubble. And they're just and, and, and until fiscal policy, until fiscal spending gets under control, th there's there's not a whole lot the Fed's going to be able to do to continue re reducing um, interest rates. So, you know, so we'll, you know, so we'll have to see how that uh, plays out. So, okay. So what are some of the things coming up next week? Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. So next week we've got on Monday, we got a consumer inflation expectations. We got the three-year treasury note on Tuesday. We get another CPI reading. We, then we've got the treasure, 10-year tre treasury auction. On Wednesday, we get the 30-year treasury bond auction. And on Thursday, we get the continuing jobless claims, uh, core retail sales, core PPI, uh, initial jobless claims, uh, PPI month over month. And then we get retail sales month over month. And then on Friday, the big thing is the Michigan consumer sentiment. So we got some inflation gauges, some labor market, some treasury note auctions, and then some consumer sentiment. So we got a whole bunch of stuff on, on par for next week. 
And then let's see here. Let's get in. Let's go through some more uh, news articles here. So U.S. bank margins dip again in the fourth quarter of 2023 as investors wait for a bottom. So uh, U.S. bank performance in the fourth quarter of last year was down uh, significant, took kind of a significant hit to earnings. Uh, interest payments chip further into U.S. corporate earnings in the fourth quarter of 2023. So interest payments are eating further into U.S. companies' profits as total of as total debt as a percentage of equity falls. So, you know, people's debt is th th that interest payment on the debt is going up and corporations have a lot of debt. Uh, banks face tough stress tests and brace for surprises. So the upcoming bank stress tests which help determine big banks' capital return plans can still lead to surprising outcomes, even though the scenarios are publicly available. Uh, regulators published the parameters for the stress test to determine a component of capital requirements for big banks, the stress capital buffer. The SEC largely represents estimated losses for individual institutions during a hypothetically severe downturn. So, you know, so banks, you know, they, they, they're bracing for a tougher stress test environment as they probably should. Uh, large U.S. and European banks' trading income slips in the fourth quarter of 2023 as volatility diminishes. So how are U.S. companies feeling about inflation? So there are uh, persistently high prices are making it harder for corporations such as McDonald's to bring in more customers. Uh, rising labor costs are one of the primary reasons that snack maker Kraft Heinz is raising its prices. Um, higher prices cut into sales of PepsiCo, while Hershey and Krispy Kreme are seeing price pressures for ingredients like coca and sugar. So inflation may be on a downward path, but that doesn't mean that companies and consumers aren't still grappling with higher prices. Inflation has been declining since its highs in 2022, but it's still above the Federal Reserve's target at 2%. Corporate executives have been talking about price pressures on their earnings calls, whether it's fewer customers wanting to pay elevated prices or higher costs affecting bottom line. So uh, Bitcoin crosses 63,000 as ETF volumes soar and having nears. So Bitcoin is trading over 63,000 for the first time since November 2021. Trading volumes for the fur for the uh, the new nine spot Bitcoin ETFs hit a new all time high on last Monday. Optimism around spot Bitcoin ETFs and the upcoming halving is driving market sentiment, according to Grayscale Report, and then major crypto-related stocks such as um, MSTR, Coin, and Riot uh, have hit year-to-date highs in this latest rally. U.S. U.S. corporate debt issuance starts to slow in 2024. So U.S. corporate bond issuance got off to a sluggish start in 2024, a possible sign that higher for longer interest rates are denting companies' willingness to take on new debt. Yes, and those interest is taking a chunk out of it. So uh, lending outlook for big U.S. banks is subdued after a soft fourth quarter of 2023. So the largest U.S. banks are pessimistic about a near-term rebound in loan growth after more weak performance in the fourth quarter of last year. Um, Citizens Financial is more upbeat on multifamily than on office commercial real estate. Yeah, I would say so. It seems fair. Um, CFPB limits credit card late fee rule to large issuers, as I talked about a few minutes ago. So the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau finalized its proposed rule to limit financial institutions credit card late fees. Republic First Bank, um, which I did a whole episode about last week. So they must plot their next steps after the Nor Norcross Broca Group pulls out their $35 million investment. So, yeah, they've got some big things coming up there, and we will keep an eye on that one to see how that unfolds. Um, bankruptcy filings are on the rise. Here's why an even bigger surge is looming. So bankruptcies are on the rise as pandemic-related relief measures come to an end and higher interest rates push business owners over the edge. So bankruptcy filings of all types peaked at around 1.6 million in 2010 during the height of the Great Recession and plateaued at around 774,000 annually in the years leading up to the COVID-19 pandemic. In the subsequent years, with a host of relief programs for individuals, families, and businesses taking effect, the number of annual fi filings slid to about 388,000. So, but the uh, the debt to loan delinquency rates increase, more bankruptcy filings for bigger companies, larger companies already are seeing a substantial surge in bankruptcy filings, according to data from S&P Market Intelligence, 
which tracked bankruptcies for public companies and for private companies with either public debt of more than $2 million or with assets or liabilities above $10 million. So it's an interesting thing to keep uh, an eye on. So the flight to quality trend in office markets has its own set of nuances. So a preference for the newest or so-called trophy office space has been uh, frequently cited as a key driver of corporate decision making when it comes to business sites, especially since the COVID-19 pandemic. That preference may ultimately be less about which buildings offer the best fitness or conference centers and instead be more about where those buildings are located. This flight to quality narrative may be a bit played out at this point, or at least it seems to be used in an incorrect way by some. Um, to me, this evolution in office is more about metros and neighborhoods where buildings, regardless of class, are either going to do quite well over the next few years or they're going to become obsolete. It really turns out that the old saying, location, 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 is still incredibly valuable and maybe more than ever in this asset class. Okay, in uh, Philadelphia, four uh, buildings in Center City office portfolio were handed back to a lender. So uh, Philadelphia has seen a number of office properties in distress going to special servicers and things in uh, recent weeks. And now here's another one with four more uh, Center City buildings. The National Observer, the turnover tsunami is over and job hopping is a risky business. So job hoppers beware. The turnover tsunami is over and leaving is now a risky business. So um yeah so just something to keep aware of so base so yeah so now uh the the great resignation is is uh history as they say so uh large banks special assessment fees climb as deposit insurance losses mount operating expenses take a bigger share of u.s corporate revenues in the fourth quarter of 2023 Truest uh, insurance exit uh, is a potential bellwether as capital requirements tighten. So, uh, so Truist Bank basically sold off their insurance division. So Truist Financial Corp's massive sale of its remaining insurance business stands out as a response to impending heightened capital requirements and a potential bellwether as surging insurance valuations continue to entice US, U.S. banks to cash out. So there has been a trend more recently, I would say in the last year or so, a lot of banks have been selling off their insurance units or insurance divisions. Uh, I'll probably need to do an episode of that or talk a little bit more about that because it is it is a kind of an interesting thing to look at. So uh, Federal Home Loan Bank of New York reports cybersecurity incident. So the Federal Home Bank of New York disclosed that unknown persons attempted to fraudulently obtain funds from the bank on February 21st due to a compromise at a fourth party vendor. The bank's information technology systems and networks were not compromised or affected. No unauthorized transactions were executed and no monies were transferred to unknown persons. So the bank said that it immediately activated its response process and took prompt steps to remediate the incident. So there you go. Um, KeyCorp CFO pours cold water on office to multifamily conversions, basically saying that, yeah, yeah you're not going to be able to convert all these office buildings over to apartment buildings. Like that's just not going to work out. Um, the problem is big banks getting bigger. So recent regional uh, banking crises have revived debates about the size of banks. Larger banks have been more insulated from some of the pressures hitting their smaller peers, such as deposit outflows and heavy concentrations in commercial real estate lending. This suggests that letting banks get bigger might be a pathway to stability, though uh, one that uh, critics would charge uh, shifts the burden to taxpayers to backstop more too big to fail behemoths or would concentrate banking in a way that hurts customers. Another problem. Getting to uh, bigger banks means growing smaller and medium-sized banks. And what we are seeing is that this process can be fraught with risk. Um, yeah, that's a very interesting topic and one that I would probably like to cover in more detail. Institutions on FDIC's problem bank list climbed to highest point since the first quarter of 2021. Um, <clears throat> small business owner carrying debt loads, carrying bigger debt loads than they did pre-pandemic. Um, high volatility commercial real estate loans rose at banks in the fourth quarter of 2023. Uh, U.S. bank branch sales set for resurgence following strong start, start in 2022. Uh, smaller local banks are drawing more interest from people as they seek to seek um, security from some of the issues with larger or regional banks. Um, 
U.S. seeks to collect up to 20 billion in delinquent COVID loans. So this is kind of this is kind of interesting. I'll probably have to do an episode on this uh, with the COVID loans. Uh, yeah, the SBA is basically finally starting to go after people who either are delinquent or committed fraud in some of their COVID loans after they got pressured by Congress to to do so. So, but we'll uh, talk more about that later. Let's see what else do we have here. Um, Okay, some of the economic activity. So consumer credit rises 4.6% in January. That's good. Uh, what else do we got here? Uh, let's skip that. FDIC, we talked about that already. What else we got here? Private sector ads, 147,000 jobs in February. Uh, private sector payrolls increased by 140,000 jobs in February following an upward revision, revised increase of 111,000 jobs in January. According to ADP, annual pay was up 5.1% year over year, down from a 5.2% annual increase the previous month. Now, that's interesting because I had actually saw a report earlier in the week that said that the jobs number, the number of jobs created in January was actually revised downward. So I'll have to take a look at that. So wholesale inventories decline in January. Wholesale inventories, a component of U.S. gross domestic product, decreased 0.3% in January and were down 2.5% from a year ago. Um, let's see. Do we have anything else? I thought I might have a couple more things in here. Service sector activity con uh, continues to ex expansion. Um, economic activity in the service sector expanded in February for the 14th consecutive month, though at a slower pace than in January. And factory orders decreased in January. New orders for manufactured goods decreased 3.6% in January following a 0.3% decline in December. Uh, manufacturing activity and construction spending declined. So economic activity and manufacturing sector contracted at a faster pace in February and was below growth neutral for the 16th consecutive month. Man. But uh, so that economic de fact activity of manufacturing is just going downhill like a rock. Uh, construction spending decreased 0.2% in January, but remained up to 11.7% from the year before. And consumer sentiment declined 2.7% in February on modestly increased inflation expectations, but remained up 14.9% from a year ago. Um, okay. So there's your, there's, wow. A lot, of, a lot of stuff there. A lot, a lot of stuff to go through there. So I wasn't kidding at the beginning when I said there was a lot of information, there's a lot of stuff going on here. So, okay. So what else do I got going on this week? Okay. So, um, <clears throat> just some other episodes to make you guys aware of. So I, I posted up interviews. I did an interview with Alex Blumstrom from Alex Blum Creates. Uh, that was really interesting. So it was basically, we offered Gen Z financial tips uh, because she had gotten a lot of questions from people uh, over, I mean, she's, you know, doing very well building her business and her social media presence. And she gets a lot of questions or her crowd is mainly uh, Gen Z and young millennials. So she gets a lot, of, she was starting to get financial questions from them. So wanted to try to work with her on a video for that. So that we put that out. Um, I have updated information on beneficial ownership information. Everybody needs to go check that out, especially if you're a small business owner. Uh, New York City Community Bank uh, put up an episode about that, updating on everyone on what's going on there. Um, Lords of Easy Money, uh, part five on chapter four uh, went up. And I would tell everybody, go check. I just made a ton of changes, re kind of revamped uh, the website a lot. So www.thebankernextdoor. So uh, please go on and check that out. You know, we you know, did a um, number of nice things on there now, uh, different data points and other things that are out there. So, um, so. If you, so again, uh, to wrap up, I basically say if everybody uh, if everybody liked this video, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe. That always helps the channel. Be sure you can follow us on YouTube, Rumble, and all major podcast platforms. Please make sure to leave comments below. Uh, I always enjoy getting back to people on their comments. And um, 
you know, we just got a lot going on, a lot, lot happening right now. So, um, and again, I would just tell people, you know, this, this podcast, it's an educational podcast. I mean, I really hope that uh, people are enjoying this so far. I hope that people feel like the information I'm bringing them is, is valuable and keeping them updated on what's happening with uh, economic activity and the banking industry. And, um, you know, got a lot of really good things planned for the next uh, couple months, you know, different interviews, uh, different topics, different things I'm going to be focusing on and covering that uh, I think people really like some some extra perks for the podcast audience, hopefully coming very soon. And, um, you know, so definitely more coming down the pike. So I hope everyone out there has an absolutely wonderful week and your weekend warrior will be back next weekend. And I hope everyone has a great time out there and I'll talk to you again soon. Thanks a lot.